All right, greetings. Now we can get started. Sorry, everybody. Um, technical issues. One of these days, we're going to get it all worked out. Um, but <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, details to, uh, to do here. Let's pray, and we'll get started with the after church. Again, I'm sorry for the delay. Let's pray. Father, as we uh, dig a little deeper into... Uh, some of the issues that we talked about this morning, I know that we're just barely brushing the surface of this. These are um, uh, quite difficult issues that, that we need to uh, approach with discernment and um, spiritual, uh, spiritual discernment, but with a lot of humility and asking for your direction rather than being dogmatic in the way that we feel about um, certain things. So I just pray that you will guide us in, into um, this conversation, and we will give you the glory in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, uh, any questions that we have before we get started? Um, yes, ma'am. Miss Candy. are politically involved and, and are trying to get a Christian group to vote as a block. Um, and, and what do I think about that? Um, I, I think that organizations outside of the church have every right to try and organize any group to vote for what they believe in. So as long as that is a secular, I mean, a, not completely secular, but as long as that is an organization that operates outside of the church to get Christians to, um, to be aware of the issues and to responsibly vote, no problem whatsoever. Uh, that's, not, that's not what I mean when I say that the church has no problem place in politics. I'm talking about in here. I'm talking about from this pulpit. I'm talking about in our doctrine and our presentation to actively push political solutions. Now there is nothing wrong with Christians being politically active. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is those are the tools of the culture to change and not the tools of the kingdom. The tools of the kingdom are prayer and the gospel and the, the truth of God and getting that truth of God out there. The more we educate um, people as far as the truth of scripture, like for instance our school, where we're taking kids from out, out of the culture, bringing them into the school and teaching them foundational truths all the way up. We're, 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 we're putting out youngsters who at least have been exposed to the truth. That is hugely important. Uh, and, and it's very much, we teach American history. We, you know, we, 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 we teach political responsibility. Uh, in other words, cherishing your vote. That's completely different from the discussion of whether or not a church in its doctrine and in its preaching and, and in what it motivates the congregation to do should not be political. Now let's just use that same example because I'm, I'm not accusing that particular group of doing this. But if they were to come into the church and set up a booth and we were to bring them forward in the worship service to put forward whatever their political agenda is, then that's a whole different situation. You are incorporating that into the worship of God that is not designed to do that. 
Now, I, w I would also make an exception more for an outside organization that is simply trying to get Christians to vote without necessarily telling them who to vote for. I I'm, I'm not saying we, well, I would bring that into the church, but that is, that's fine. You know, that's not what I would call political. However, I, you know the reason they're doing that is because they want Christians with Christian values to vote for those values and thereby change the landscape of politics. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong for Christians to be politically involved. The problem is, is that the church as a whole, modern Christendom, looks to political solutions as the solution to our problems. And, and, it's, and it's almost like, at least in the conversations that I have, it's almost like, you know, when people say, oh, and all we could do is pray. You know, uh, there was nothing else. We tried everything we could do, and then there was nothing left to do with but pray. Well, wait a minute, that's backwards. Y you know, it, it really, we go to the Lord first with our prayers, and then we try to do everything else. Well, it's kind of the, this, the same way, uh, you know, uh, oh yeah, I want, we want to pray for revival, but the real meat and potatoes of what we're going to do is our own political activism. And, and I just think the church really has bought into that. Hook, line, and sinker to where they're really using the tools of the culture instead of the tools of the kingdom. So, it's a good question. Anybody else before I... Um, well, here's what I thought we would do. Um, this is a far more um, difficult issue when we actually put it into practice than it seems on the surface. And so I, I want to take us to Romans 13 and then to 1 Peter 2. And, and I want to go ahead and read these passages and I want to discuss the reason behind why seeking political solutions runs against the fiber of the kingdom. Um, uh, that, it, again, I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong for people to have political opinions. Believe it or not, some people accuse me of not being wishy-washy and going back and forth. I, I do have very strong political opinions I, I, as far as, you know, what, what our finances should be, what our social programs should be. I, I do have an opinion. I work very, very hard in this church to keep my political opinions out of anything that I say or do. And especially in a church like ours where we have such a broad spectrum of people involved with different political parties and different political ideologies. If we bring politics as a solution to anything inside the church, and I have seen it happen in this church, I fight against it as much as I possibly can, there's division immediately within the body. There is a loss of unity and there is division that shows up amongst people. You cannot have a political conversation with someone who is on the opposite political side of the fence than you are under the kinds of intense situations that we have right now and have it be usually a congenial conversation. Sooner or later, you know, the fangs are going to come out and there's going to be a fight because you just, I mean, they're just so opposite in the way that you look at it. That's the reason I think that we have to try very hard as a body of Christ to keep politics out of the church, but not the adherence to the truth. And I think, and I don't think, I know that's the solution to so much of the problem um, that, that hit the church. So let me read from Romans 13 um, some of, uh, of what uh, uh, Paul says about this. The first seven verses um, as far as submitting to authorities. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Now when Paul says that, um, he specifically states it in a way that is, Peter's going to do the same thing, that is inclusive of 
a many levels of government authority that is placed over us. So it's not just the emperor, as Peter's going to say, it's the, the governors, it's the whole hierarchy of politics. Now what makes this so confusing is that usually and quite often they're at odds with each other. I mean, just look at the situation we're in right now. If you, if you had any dealings with the, the government and keeping schools open or closing them down, wearing masks, whatever you have to do, we have the federal government with one idea. We have the state government with a completely different idea. We have the county government with a completely different idea again and then, or go back to the federal government, and then you have a city government. I mean, so depending on where you are, you've got all these confusing, conflicting um, um, messages to listen to. So who do you subject yourself to when they're not even in agreement? So um, that's why I say this is not all that easy. And it requires a, a, a humble spirit to go to God with the right the right frame of heart um, to ask what we do in certain situations. So continuing with Paul, for there is no authority except from God. Paul makes it clear that no authority. Now, brothers and sisters, th this is um, so important that we recognize this does not mean good authorities. This does not mean authorities that have uh, agree with what you agree with. When, again, when Paul wrote this and when Peter wrote this, you remember who the emperor was, right? Probably the most despicable human being who's ever lived, Nero. He, he's, the, he's the guy in charge that they're saying, you be subject to him, be submissive to him. So it doesn't mean governments you agree with. It, it doesn't mean good governments. It doesn't mean fair governments. It means any government God has put in place. All authority comes from God. Peter's going to take it much farther than Paul does. But he, he says, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Now what does that tell you? When, when, when Paul says, those that exist have been instituted by God. Does that mean that God simply turned his face and let Satan have his way? No. It means that God has ordained the government. Now it's hard for us to imagine that God would ordain a administration that is wholeheartedly for abortion. To me, that's just like, wow, that, that's, that, how can that be? or an administration that is wholeheartedly for same-sex marriage and homosexuality and um, gender lunacy. I mean, it's just, that's hard to believe. But what Paul says is that God not only allowed that, he instituted it, okay? That should speak loudly to the church, folks. That should speak hugely, loudly to the church, that God doesn't do anything randomly. He doesn't do anything without a purpose and a reason. We don't know what that reason is, but that means that those who are currently in power are in power because they are accomplishing God's will for him, okay? Like Pharaoh did, 400 something years of terrible slavery. He accomplished God's will for him, and that's very clear in what he says. So, therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Now, when I, I, I see those who are involved with liberation theology, and liberation theology is that Jesus came to free the captive. So, if you're under an oppressive government, rise up against it, okay? Um, actually, what Paul says is the opposite. Now, let me ask you a, a Difficult question. Does that mean that the American Revolution is a valid revolution? Was it God sanctioned? Or was it going against the will of God? 
Nobody wants to answer that one, do, do you? Nobody wants to step out of the line of patriotism, but in reality, according to the strict letter of this law, the American Revolution, well, I mean, the American Revolution was an illegal revolution, therefore immoral. Now, of course, God uses immoral things for his good, which he did with that. Re <laughs> Linda's saying, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm glad you turned that one around. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you have to, I mean, this is, but that is exactly where we need to be. We need to be so in tune to the Word of God that when it comes in conflict with our political, patriotic beliefs, that we don't back down from the Word of God. That we say, okay, guess what? We rebelled against a valid government and departed from it. And according to this, that was not what God calls his church to do or Christians to do. Now, we, we go back and you, you say someone like John Knox, okay? John Knox taught that we should actively be involved with military overthrow of oppressive governments or, who are over us. In them, it was first the French and then, then the English. Um, uh, Ulrich Zwingli in Switzerland, one of the first great theologians of the Reformation, actually died on the battlefield trying to win Switzerland militarily to enforce Protestantism on the Catholics. Catholics didn't like it. They burned his body, mixed it with dung, and threw it in the river after they killed him. Um, so it, it never has actually quite worked out all that well. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Bonhoeffer is an excellent um, example. What, what do you do? And he wrote a book while he was in, in uh, a prison called, well, it was just entitled Ethics. And he struggled with that intensely. Um, now, do you, do you stand for what is good or what is not? Now, I haven't finished, okay? Because there is a reason and a time when you rise up against or when, when you don't submit yourself to the governing authorities is when they blatantly deny the will of God. When they tell you you have to do something that is against God's will or they impede you from doing something that is something God's will requires. So in other words, the age old question that you get in every seminary ethics class is, you're, a, you're, you're, an, you're a, 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 an, an English person living in Poland and you've got an attic full of Jews hiding from the Third Reich and they knock on your door and ask you straightforward, do you have any Jews hiding here? Is it ethical to lie to them? Is it ethical to tell them I've got Jews up there because, you know, um, you know what's going to happen to them, they're, they're, they're going to die. And, and so th we need to keep in mind that the ethical standard of the kingdom surpasses the ethical standards of the world. Now what John the Baptist was doing was speaking out against Herod for not having his conscience captive to the word of God, as Martin Luther said. Okay, in other words, he was actively abrogating his right to rule by blatant immorality in his life and behavior in the way that um, uh, uh, he lived. Now, if Herod had come to John and said, John, you have to bow down and worship me, then John would rightfully refuse, okay? if he asked him to do something that God demands, denies that you can do. Or if he said, John, like they told Daniel, stop praying, okay? You can't pray to anyone except Darius. Well, then Daniel doesn't do that because they're asking him to do something that God has specifically told him to do. So the time that we override this is when what they are telling us to do or not to do is contrary to the will of God. Okay? You with me? 
All right. But you're going to suffer the consequences. All right? You have to be prepared. Count the cost. Because you have to be prepared to suffer the consequences. In other words, first century church. They're pulling people out of their houses because they've been ratted on by somebody in the neighborhood that they're Christians. They're being pulled out of their houses and thrown in jail. And Nero lights them up in his garden as Roman candles. Fun and games, right? Burn somebody to death in front of you so, uh, to, to light his garden while he's having a party. Um, evil, absolute evil. Does the Bible teach that the first century Christians should have risen up to overthrow that evil? That's not that hard of a question. No, it doesn't. But what are the consequences? Horrible death. Horrible torture. A horrible end. Okay? That's what it means to abide by the sovereign will and law of God. Now, of course, we read in Revelation that every single one of those martyrs is, that's, those are the martyrs underneath the altar that are calling out to God to avenge their blood. And God says, vengeance is mine. It's not yours. So you don't rise up and rebel against the, the government. You leave that to me. That's my job. Your job is to resist until they tell you to do something you shouldn't or to tell you not to do something that you should. But when that happens, you don't go rebelling because Paul says you don't do that. You suffer the consequences. You suffer. It is, it is just, that's what happened to John the Baptist. He suffered. And, and that's the whole idea. Pilgrims coming over was because of religious uh, persecution. They wanted them to work the one one type of religion, isn't that correct? And right. the, the the monarch was in charge of the religion, and so they fled that for the to be able to worship. Religious freedom of the new world. Right. Right. So. So. So wouldn't that be a reason, religious freedom, to be able to worship true, the true God and what the Bible teaches versus what? Um, let's help help me articulate I'm, 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 started it. I'm, I'm letting you think it through on, on your own. Because, all right, let's put that back into John the Baptist. John the Baptist is calling upon the people to repent for the forgiveness of sins. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, trust in the Savior so that you will be spiritually free. And he is speaking out, upholding the ethical standards. Remember, ethics are the standards. Morality is how well you adhere to those standards. He's upholding the morality of the kingdom and uh, 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 speaking out against the, the, the sins around him. When he was stopped, did he run a rebellion from the prison cell, which he could have easily done? Did he motivate his disciples? Did he look to Jesus and say, okay, great, Jesus, you're here, bring down fire and brimstone uh, upon these people? He died in prison. The model of the first century church, the martyrs that we read about in Revelation, they died. Okay? Now, we assume that dying is a bad thing, all right? Which is crazy. That's upside down. You know, to leave this world of pain and sorrow and go and be with the Lord for an eternity in bliss is not a bad thing. In some ways, that's actually, except for the pain, that's actually a blessing to take you out of this world and take you to a world where it's better. It's we who are left behind that struggles so much because we've lost somebody dear to us. But for them, it's like glorious, right? Um, so in answer to your question, um, no, 
that would not do it. In fact, that was not the reason that the American Revolution was fought. It was over a penny increase in the tax. It was financial. It was all about no taxation without representation. That's what the snake was. Don't tread on me, right? So it wasn't for religious freedom. It, it, and it, I mean, that was the side part of it. And all the men who were involved with that were solid, reformed Christians. And they wrote that into our standard of government. So God used that in a mighty way. But if you're going to be technical about it, don't try to defend the, the American Revolution any more so than the French because the French was done in a horribly wicked, terrible way, but it was still rebellion against the authority that God had placed over them. God blessed America because he wanted to bless America despite all of the wickedness that we have done. And don't, don't, don't think that in our history we're all a bunch of saints. And don't think that the founders who wrote the Federalist Papers are all a bunch of saints. They were brilliant men, kind of like the, the men who wrote the Westminster Confession that God just brought some amazing people together at one time. And you never, ever could have gotten that form of government out of a godless society. That, I mean, that just reeks of Christianity in every page or every um, aspect of it. So Christianity had a major impact on it, and, and that's all God's will. But, you know, sometimes God brings, brings uh, things about. Um, um, uh, and, and uses the, the, the mistakes that we make. Now, I don't, I don't want to travel up that road too far because I know that people are very patriotic about the American Revolution. I just want, I'm just making a point that when we compare that to what Paul says, then if we were living strictly according to this, we would have let God overthrow the English government. Might have done it without any bloodshed. You know, who knows? Because we took things that matters into our own hands and did it ourselves in a way other than what Scripture states. Okay? Um, I can see how popular that idea is. Uh, go, going on, look in verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Now, I wish that we could impress that upon each person who is fighting the government or standing for defunding the police or um, all those who wanted to defund the military and, and to take the sword away from the state, from the authority that God places over you. Paul is telling Christians, and if you live according to the standards that God has given you, then you have nothing to fear. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not going to have a tyrant like Stalin. Did you ever hear any of the stories about Stalin? You know, if there was a, uh, he, if he gave a speech, everybody dreaded him giving a speech because everybody would stand after the speech and applaud his speech. And they would applaud, and they would applaud. And the first person that stopped applauding, the secret police would come and take them away. Okay? And, and, and that was life under Stalin. <laughs> you know, uh, more Christians killed under Stalin than, than uh, in, in, in the, uh, uh, the, the, the German um, genocide of the Jews. Uh, something like, according, I, I read it one time, something in the neighborhood of 23 million, somewhere in there, just, just annihilated, just eliminated, because um, he was getting rid of the church in Russia. You know, he was, he, he was doing what people have tried to do all throughout history, is to, I got to get rid of those pesky Christians, and I can do what I want to, because those pesky Christians, they live by a higher power, and I can't control them. Um, so, uh, I mean, Stalin was a great example of a Nero-type leader. And, and, um, and, and we may see that again. You, you don't know, but that's what the, uh, Paul is saying, is that even, even with rulers like that, if you do what is good, under normal circumstances, you have nothing to fear that so many of those people, and I'm, I know I'm painting in a broad brush here, and I don't want you know, to, to uh, say something that's not true, but most of those who are fighting against uh, authority 
are also not living the way Paul calls you to live. He says, if you live according to the standards of Scripture, then guess what? You're, you're not going to have any trouble with the governing authorities. It's when you begin to act in other ways that they do what they're called to do, which is to be the state. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but, and conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good. I mean, to me, that seems pretty simple, doesn't it? Would that be a nice message for us to get out to the um, culture? Do you think that would be a nice message for us to get out to the church? I held a seminar where I taught this to a group of teachers. And when it was over, and I made my, my comments on what Paul was saying, um, one of the teachers came up to me furious that how, how could you not give us time to process this new and unheard of teaching? And, and, and I asked, have you never read Romans? You've not read this? Oh, I don't read the Bible. Teaching in a, in a Christian school. Um, I, don't, I don't read scripture in any depth except for the Gospels and the, and the verses that, that they liked. Um, furious that something that is established in scripture would, would be taught as truth and then assumptions made on that truth without giving Christians the time to absorb what the Bible said. I, I was blown away by that. I, I mean, that just kills me. But if you read the statistics, you'll realize that most people never crack the, most people who go to Christian churches, most people in Christendom never crack the book. They never open the book. They don't read the Bible. They don't study the Bible. I, I mean, I think over 50% of those who call themselves born again Christians cannot even say that I've read the Bible this month. Not even once. And so therefore, one of the things that we need to do, and now why, whose fault is that? Whose fault is it that the people who are going to church every week are not learning scripture? It's mine, it's the preacher. It's not being preached, it's not being taught. And so you can go to church your whole life and never get anything but the same things drilled over and over and over again, and, and, and you're not learning what scripture says. Scripture here says that if you do good, you've got nothing to fear from those who are in power because God has put those who are in power over you so that they can keep the peace and protect your life and to punish evildoers and to reward good doers. That's normally what a government is supposed to do. And most people don't realize that. Hey, just act right, pay your taxes, do what's right, and for the most part, you're going to be left alone by the governing authorities. That's not always true, and you know that. But um, you do what is good, you'll receive his, his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. Now, he's not necessarily talking about a Christian leader. He's talking about Nero, okay? He's talking about the guy who was the most disgusting person um, who, who the church has ever faced. He says, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God and avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Yes, Steve. Did you blame yourself if you were not reading the Bible? Did I blame myself? No. I blame preachers. I blame preachers for not teaching their congregations out of to to teach to study the Bible okay um, the preacher is the one who has to introduce their congregations to scripture and every week or as often as he gets in front of them to delve deeper into the scriptures if the alternative is we talk about topical issues we talk about you know political issues we talk about social issues 
and I find a verse or two to refer to, and usually they're the same verses, then I'm not doing what I'm called to do as a preacher, which is to exposit the Word of God. two different things there, but I would agree with you. I would agree that a true Christian, I'm, I'm really still sort of talking about Christendom, a modern Christendom, the majority of what is called the evangelical church, and, and I'm not necessarily talking of true Christians. You're 100% right. A true Christian is going to have a hunger for the Word of God and are, are going to seek it out where it can be found. Um, I, I'm, I, I didn't make that clear, so you're 100% you're right, that um, uh, I, I'm still speaking more of Christendom and the, the visible church writ large that's out there. And most people in the visible church writ large are not reading the Bible. And the reason they're not reading it is, I can't blame it entirely on preachers, but I can blame it to a large degree on preachers because they're not being taught to read the Bible or to even put a primary importance on the Bible. Okay, um, continuing. Verse 5, Therefore one must be in subjection. Pretty strong word. One must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Here we go with conscience again. Conscience that is... Um, um, captivated or captured by the Word of God. For the same reason, you must also pay taxes for the authorities or ministers of God attending to this very thing. So that's one of the first tangible things that we have to do is pay taxes. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue it is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Now, this is something that I also find real difficulty within the Christian church, um, the real church now, that even within our church, I see, and I've been pastor here for 17 years, so I've seen a variety of political orientations, um, and I've seen a lot of dishonoring of people who are in office, not, not giving any honor to them in that office because they're in that office. It doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but it does mean that you honor in the sense that there's no way that Joe Biden makes the presidency unless God instituted it, period. So we should all be praying for Joe Biden. We should all be praying for Kamala Harris because they're here, they're where they are because God placed them there. And, and so therefore, um, um, uh, uh, it's important uh, um, and, and compelling that we do that, that we give respect to those who should have respect and honor to those who uh, should have honor. And you say, well, wait a minute, there's nothing but a degenerate in, the, in this office or that office. And once again, I'm going to point you right back to Nero. Okay? I'm going to point you right back to Nero because that's who was in charge when Paul wrote that. Any questions? on so far on what we've read in Romans turn over to first Peter and let's pick up first Peter 2 because Peter takes it beyond just the government and speaks of all kinds of authority that God has put in place and how we are to be subject to that authority Verse 13 of the second chapter, we'll start there. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. I don't know if you remember our study of Peter. We had to cut it off pretty close to here. Um, when we were in this section when the pandemic started and we stopped having Sunday night services. But we, we noticed in going through the first couple of chapters of Peter that almost everything he did or said was in the context of 
evangelism was in the context of sharing the good news. In other words, when he called us to behavior in a certain way, it wasn't as legalistic as, I hate to say that, I should take that back, sorry. Um, Paul wasn't legalistic, but he was legally oriented as an ex-Pharisee. He, he, he would really concentrate on this is what God says, so that's the law. Peter tended to put everything in the context of, uh, of we do this so we can lead someone to Christ. Even if, it, if it's degrading to you, well, the more important thing is whether or not the gospel is going to be shared with somebody who desperately needs to hear it. So um, that's why he says, be subject for the Lord's sake, for his glory to every human institution. Now, once again, notice his choice of words every human institution. Now that doesn't mean every institution, it means each institution formed by humans, the hierarchy of authority that have been put in place for the governance of large groups of people. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, once again, Nero is the emperor, or to his governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. There he's just, he's just reflecting what Paul said, that, you know, they're given the sword, their, their job, their reason for being for the state is to protect the life of its citizens and to, um, to in, increase or to, to seek the well-being of his citizens, um, or, or her citizens, as the case may be. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Obviously, what he's talking about is the gospel. Those who sit here and say that Christians, of course, during that day, remember what they were saying about Christians? What were they saying about Christians? They ate their babies. Okay, that they, they, they go in there and they eat their babies because they have these, these, uh, these cultish rites. Um, that there's a lot of incest going on between them because they call each other brother and sister all the time. Okay, so they're all, you know, there's all kinds of, they're thinking about the way Christians are doing through their own, you know, degenerate minds. And so Peter is saying, hey, listen, don't give them any fodder. And so I say to the church, church, don't give the culture any fodder to say bad, I mean, they're gonna say bad things about us as it is. Don't give them reasons to hate us all the more, you know, by, by acting in certain ways. Let's try to do good so we can put that ignorance to silence. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God, living as truly free people. Is it possible for any human being to be absolutely free? I, I said absolutely. I didn't say spiritually or in a redemptive sense. I said, is it possible for any human being to be free? There's actually only one free being in the universe, and that's God. God is absolutely free. We are bound in this world by certain things. What are we bound by? Gravity, oxygen, food, water. So you're not entirely free. You're not free to stop eating. Because if you do stop eating, you're, 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 you're gonna stop breathing. So we're not entirely free but the freedom that Peter is talking about is the freedom, as Janice said, that is given to us in Christ, freedom from our sins, freedom from any divine retribution. And because we are free from divine retribution, we should act like it. <laughs> and if there was ever a message for the church, that's another one. Why don't we act like we're redeemed? Why don't we act like this life right now is just a blink? and that we have an eternity that we're going to be with God. How come that's not our focus? How come the glory that has been given to us, the fact that we deserve hell and are going to um, not go to hell, how come that doesn't govern the way we act? 
in our lives because it doesn't. And, and I'm not pointing the finger as it does it with me either. I get wrapped up in the small things of life and I forget the fact that I've been redeemed. So that's what Peter is saying, to act in society like the redeemed, free, guiltless, um, forgiven, and righteously declared, not your own righteousness, but Christ, people that you are. Um, he goes on and says, um, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, okay, um, to live double lives, in other words, to live one life when you're in church, the other life when you're um, at home. Um, um, fear God, I'm sorry, where, where was I? Living as servants of God, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, what's he say? What did he say? Honor the emperor. Honor. Okay. I, uh, I, I, I read this in a seminar I was teaching one time, and the response of one of the people was, define honor. And, and I still regret that I didn't have a Greek dictionary with me. I could just turn to the word and say, okay, this, this, this is what it means. Um, but the immediate question was, do you have to like someone or agree with them to honor them? And the answer is no. No, honor is something that you give. It is a weight that you attach to someone because God has placed them in a position of authority over you. And the one you truly are honoring is not the person who occupies that place, but God who placed that person there, recognizing that he never makes mistakes and he doesn't do random things and so therefore by honoring the person that God has put over you you in a implicit way are honoring God and that's kind of the underlying message here for all of this servants be subject to your masters with all respect not only to the good and gentle but also to the unjust did you read that Servants, be subject to your master. So he switches. Now he's not just talking about all of us and our relationship with the governments. Now he's talking about what class of people. Okay, the ESV has nicely translated this as servants, but what does the actual word mean? Slaves. Was there slavery when Peter wrote this? Were a large number of Christians slaves? in other people's houses, meaning they didn't have any freedom. So what did Peter just say? He says, servants, be subject to your masters. Is that all he said? Not only the good and gentle, but also to the what? Unjust. Okay, so what happens to the current concept of social justice right there? I'm serious here. I'm, I'm, I'm not asking a redundant or rhetorical question. What happens to all the churches who are right now, including our denomination, has an entire segment that is here to push social justice and social reparations? Where does social justice fit into this when we are told to honor and respect and submit to even the unjust. You see how hard this is? Nobody's enjoying this. And I don't see any, any smiles on anybody's faces because this is, this, this is taking us to a new place that runs against what our culture says. Our culture says if this, you're unjust, you're, you're justified in rising up against them, doesn't it? That's not what the Bible teaches. I'm sorry, it's just not. It teaches that we are to allow vengeance to be the Lord's. And as long as they are, even if they're unjust, as long as they are not actively telling us to do something against the Word of God, or actively um, uh, denying us to be able to do what the Word of God says, then we are to be subject to that government, even if it's unjust, or that master. Continuing, I can see I'm making a lot of friends this morning. Um, uh, <clears throat> verse 19, for this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. Okay, what did Peter just say? 
What did Peter just say? If by suffering unjustly, as your Lord did, you can turn one heart to Christ, then every bit of that suffering is worth it. A lifetime of unjust suffering is worthwhile if that lifetime of unjust suffering is what God uses to break the heart of the one who is subjecting you to that suffering. Because what really matters is not your rights. What really matters is that person's eternity in heaven. The very one who is oppressing and repressing and beating on you and treating you unjustly. Okay? Um, <clears throat> it's a good thing that I'm used to teaching with Zippo response from anyone, okay? I'm very good at that. Uh, I've been doing it for, for many, many years. Um, so th that's certainly the case now, and it, it is the case usually when, when we go into these, because as I said, it requires spiritual discernment to know how to thread through and apply these. Um, for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer of it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Did you hear that? And he just keeps getting worse and worse here, folks. I mean, it's not getting any better. He's not turning this around. There's no big but here. What he says is that if you get beaten because you did something wrong, what, what good is there in that? You're, you're getting just punishment. But if you are beaten for something you didn't do, and you suffer with grace, then that pleases God. <laughs> Steve, <laughs> I know this is hard on a Marine. I, I know this is hard. <laughs> Yeah, always gets to the girl and disappears into the sunset. Yep. But not, not, not in this world, not in this environment. Um, and, and yeah, it, it, it is, this is completely consistent with what Jesus taught. The, but what they're doing, what both Paul and Peter are doing, especially Peter, is he's taking Jesus' broad statements when he says, turn the other cheek. Okay, I'll turn the other cheek but don't you hit me. <laughs> you know, don't, hit, don't beat me because then I'm going to respond. I'm going to react. I'm going to fight back. And Peter is saying that if you're under authority and you are struck and beaten unjustly for something someone else did, then welcome to the Jesus Club because that's what he did for you. And so by that, if you can, again, your mind should always be on every individual, how can I show Christ to them? How can I show them Christ? And you don't show Christ by turning around and hitting them in the face. That's not showing them Christ. You show Christ by graciously receiving an unjust punishment. And later on, that person says, you know something? That was unjust, and they took it anyway and they never turned around and hated me. I really would like to know a little bit more about how you did that. You know, and so Peter's mind is always on that in virtually everything that he says. Verse 20, for what, I'm sorry, I already read that, 21. For, for to this you have been called because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you might follow in his steps. That's one of the hardest verses that you're going to read as a Christian to live up to. Because Jesus, we know how he suffered. We know how he prayed for those who were murdering him. We know that he died for us when we were antagonistic at enmity with him. We know all of those things, and Peter says he's your model. That's what you're called to. Yes, ma'am, Miss Anya. Thank you. 
justly but doesn't have the same perspective? How do you get them to? Is it God that does it? Well, is there I, a way that we can teach them? Um, I think what we need to do. I'm going to answer that question in a roundabout way. Okay. Um, the, the, in other words, let's just assume that someone close to you is going through an abusive relationship, right? Now it gets into a, a, a difficult situation because that is transgressing the law of God right there, but let's just use it because it's a normal one. Um, you, you're an abusive relationship um, and, and you are also in not the best relationship, okay? The instruction, and this is not a believer and you're a believer, okay? The instruction is not for that person. It's for you and how you're going to act because you're the model for that person. You see? So Peter is saying when you act this way, you show Christ in you, and that speaks more loudly to that person who doesn't understand it and doesn't get it First of all, unbelievers are not going to get this. They're, they're not. This, 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 this is a grace that is given to believers um, and to, to experience and to act in Christ-likeness is not something the fallen unbeliever can do. And, and Christ is not their model. So they're, they're not going to get this at all. In fact, they're going to laugh at you and say this is ridiculous. Um, trust me, Sonia, in all of the years that I have canceled Canceled, counseled Freudian slip, I guess. Counseled failing marriages. And I have tried desperately to get non believers to, to treat each other like believers, to take them back to Genesis and talk about what, what marriage should be like. I mean, they look at you with blank eyes, but he did this and she did that, and you're right back in a fight, in the middle of a fight. So it, it's, it is, yes, Christian principles we should teach and preach because that is a common grace. It is also best life, and we should tell them, but if, as you said, if they're, going to, uh, if, if they're going to accept that message, it's got to be the Lord. It's got to be the Holy Spirit. That doesn't stop you from saying it, okay? We never know when what we say is going to make a profound difference on someone. Never know that. And so therefore, we never stop saying the truth. That's part of what um, um, uh, uh, we're called to do as Christians. And, and of course, especially our families get tired of hearing it. You know, there goes mom again, just, you know, same old stuff, right? You know, and so they go on autopilot, yes, and so I've got to put myself through here while she throws all this stuff out at me, and I'm going to go right back to where I was. But Proverbs tells us that those words are going to come back to them, okay? And, and that they go into there, they get buried under all the nonsense and the world input from the world, but sooner or later, when it's time for the Spirit, your words come back out because they're the words of God, they're eternal, and they never return void. Okay, so... I hope that, that that kind of answers it. You know, we're, 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 we're being called to this as believers and to be the model for those around us. Okay. Oh, yes, ma'am, Kenny. Again, the, 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 the formula, if you will, is that if you are asked to do something that transgresses the Word of God, or to not do something that explicitly He tells you to do, or even implicitly, then you, we, we respond to a higher power 
going back to Acts 5, I believe, when Peter says we must obey God rather than man. You're telling us to stop preaching Jesus? You're at my authority. The same guy who wrote this said, uh-uh, we'll never stop preaching the name of Jesus because we, 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 we must obey God rather than man. So that's where our discernment comes in, and that's where it's important that we know what Scripture says so we know what we're supposed to do, what God commands us to do or not do, so that we don't get them all muddled, you know? And unfortunately, it does get muddled. And, and I mean, I think all of, even just reading this, you realize, oh my goodness, the degree to which the culture has infiltrated my thinking, you know? It has. It just simply has. And unfortunately, so much of that is actually being actively taught in churches when it's really not what Scripture speaks of. So it, it's, that's, that's one of the reasons that I, I wanted to, um, to continue on in this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to stop it there because, um, well, let me just see this. Um, for um, for the, to this you have been called because Christ also suffered, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Okay? Huge verse. By committing himself to the one who judges justly. There is a judge that is watching everything that you do, and he will judge justly. And so therefore, in any situation we're in, there is unjustness and there is justness. We, want, we, we act justly even if we are treated unjustly, and we have a judge who deems us just in what we do and how we act. And that, of course, is the Lord. Of course, he's talking about the Father and the Son there. So the Son perfectly did that. We only do it as we uh, attempt to. But I'm going to draw it there because... Uh, uh, oh, actually, no. Let me go ahead and finish this paragraph um, because it, it, it is beautiful. Um, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And just the emphasis that I would leave this discussion with is once again, what Peter is interested in is that we actually act like Christians. And if we're going to act like Christians, we're going to act like Christ. And if we're going to act like Christ, we're not going to revile those. We're not going to dishonor those who were put in authority over us. We are not going to um, uh, seek our own rights, our own justice, but vengeance is the Lord's. Now, don't get me wrong. Our government gives us legal ways to stand up for our rights. Okay, go ahead and knock yourself out. Those are okay because they're legal. Uh, and the government says you can protest. The government says you can march. The government says you can write letters to the editor. All these things you can do, and if you want to do it, knock yourself out, that's fine. I'm not saying those are sins that you just simply roll over and do absolutely nothing. But you do what your government has given you the specific right to do. If they take that away, Well, if they tell you to stop reading the Bible, you say no. If they tell me to stop preaching, I say no. But I've got to be prepared to go to jail and not lead you guys in a, in a re rebellion against the government. Okay? Okay, good conversation. We, we'll, we'll leave it there before the discussion of men and women because that's when it gets real interesting. You know? <laughs> Husbands and wives. Uh, Peter... Um, kind of sets the, the catch such things straight. Um, I, I also want you to know that there are some implicit things here that we need to read. Um, we need to know. <clears throat> Don't have time to go into them now. But um, you, you may have heard us, especially in the new members class, we talk about um, the authority between a husband and a wife and then why we don't ordain women as pastors, why we don't ordain them as elders. And, and actually why we don't ordain women as deacons, even though there is no explicit 
argument against it. I mean, I, I hear all the arguments. I, I disagree with those who say Scripture says explicitly the women can't be deacons. Um, however, to me, when you start reading the authority structure that God has put in place, it almost makes it impossible for a wife to be a deacon when her husband is not because of the authority that is with that office, regardless of whether you say it's a it's a it's an office of service as opposed to an office of uh, teaching. It still is an office of authority within the church. And I don't see implicitly how it is possible for a wife to have authority over a husband in church when she obviously doesn't have it in the relationship. That we, and Peter makes that clear. But anyway, we'll leave that to another day's discussion. I've made enough enemies today as it is, so let me let, let me close in prayer and uh, let you guys go. Heavenly Father, um, <clears throat> thank you that you have given us, as Steve said earlier, a, a hunger for your word, a real hunger to, to, to read it, to learn it, to follow it, to um, our desire is to, to accomplish your desire, your will, and we find it in your word. So help us as we go through these and other passages that seem to run entirely against everything our culture teaches, even against what modern Christendom teaches, but is very, very central to what you taught when you became a man and walked amongst us. So we pray for the grace to accept and subject where we should and the wisdom to know when not to subject, when to stand, and when not to um, accept the mandates of a culture, who I think very quickly, very soon, are going to be enforcing things that we can't stand for. And as other churches have already done, that we just pray that we would be able to stand and face the consequences. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. God bless you, and God bless those who are uh, watching online, and hopefully next week we will get our, our stuff done so we can be uh, on time. We were actually on time today. We just got started on other things. Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord does raise the house in vain, its builders strive. To you who boast tomorrow's gain, tell me what is your life? A mist that vanishes with the dawn, all glory be to Christ, all glory.